inclusion, you know, in love, that must have been one of the things. I think, we, I think you may be coming. Great. Thank you all very much for coming today. I think we'll, we'll start. We have a lot to discuss and, and, and many big issues that we'll try to, to touch on over the coming uh, hour. We have four uh, esteemed uh, participants today, coming, I think, from very different backgrounds and, and perspectives on this, on this issue that we're going to discuss. Um, to my left, uh, Mr. we have Mr. Uh, Ushito Hori, who is the president of Globus Univers uh, University and the managing partner of Globus Capital Partners. Uh, and then Debbie Aundin, who is, uh, like me, also from Myanmar, uh, who is the founder, a founder and head of Proximity uh, Designs in, in, in Myanmar. Uh, Mr. Wolfgang Jaman, who is the Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of CARE International. And then to my right, Mr. Victor Chu, who is Chairman Chief Executive Officer of First Eastern Investment Group and also co-chair of the International Business Council. And my name is, is Thamyu. I'm the founder and partner of Ava Advisory Group in the Yangon Heritage Trust. So now we have a, a very big uh, topic to try to talk about, east-west and fusion of ideas. And I think the starting point for this discussion is really not in ASEAN, but in the West. And the sense that in the West today, we're seeing possibly some tectonic shifts in the political landscape. We've seen new styles of leadership, not least in the United States. Uh, we've seen uh, very uh, close to each other the, the Brexit referendum and the election of, of Donald Trump. And this sense, I think, uh, that there is in some way a rising discontent against the established order, established politics, established political parties, and the political establishment in general. It's very hard to quantify. It's very difficult in the West to say whether this is because of inequality, because of a certain type of economic growth, uh, whether it's because of new technology and social media or the impact of, of social media. Uh, but I think it's, 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 it's hard to, uh, to argue against the sense that there is this shifting political landscape in the West and this rising uh, discontent with the political establishment. So part of our task today is to think about uh, what that means in ASEAN in the sense of does it apply in ASEAN and more generally in, in this region. Uh, is it the case that, these, that this kind of shift in political thinking and political style, whatever its causes, are also applicable uh, in this region? Are we seeing something similar in terms of a rising discontent against the political establishment or, uh, or not? And, and so perhaps we could just begin with that and then talk a little bit about, uh, depending on our answers to that question, uh, what does that mean going forward for this region and for ASEAN in, in particular? If I could turn first to Mr. Chu. Thank you very much, Chairman. I think that the answer probably is yes and no, because the impact of technology, social media, raise expectations of the young people you know, worldwide. And, and of necessity, people are not satisfied with the status quo because competition globally is a lot more fierce. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, you, know, you know that the automation impact, robotic, and, um, and what we call the fourth industrial revolution will affect jobs. So people um, are concerned, are more anxious, expectations have grown, and they see what's happening in, 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 in the West. That's also a benchmark. Mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, Eastern value, generally speaking, mm -hmm tend to be more family um, oriented. We look at things slightly longer term. There's a high emphasis on uh, saving and edu education. Those are you know, mitigation factors against a, a fast changing world. Mm. I mean, the speed of change and technology really makes people anxious. So I think it's not mm. an easy question to answer generally. Mm. We need to look at specific economy specific country yes. uh, depending on their own political and economic cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean generalizing though, do you think it's fair to say that you know in Europe in many ways the past 40, 50 years has been a period of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Uh, in Asia though the last 40, 50 years have included periods of violent conflict, political upheaval, extreme poverty in many countries and in a way many Asian countries are just coming out of uh, a relatively dark period yes. into a period of high growth, a growing middle class. 
And so almost in every Asian country, I think people can feel that their lives are better than their parents' lives or their grandparents' lives. And perhaps that also mitigates to some extent against any kind of discontent with the status quo Absolutely. or any anxiety. Absolutely. And that's the huge opportunity because there's a leapfrogging uh, potential in the, this part of the world. I mean, look at what, uh, Cambodia. Mm. I mean, uh, the last you know, 25 years of um, uh, mm. reform and development is, is spectacular. Mm. I mean, so I think that's also an opportunity. But, but the challenge is the politics is, is challenging, mm. right? But and also glo the global market is also changing. Mm. So I think this is a compounded challenge for us too. Right. Yeah. right. And Mr. Hori, how do you see it? Well, coming from Japan, which has been enjoying stagnant economy, and therefore, it's quite similar to what we see in Europe and the US. And we don't see that kind of uh, Trump or Brexit phenomena. And uh, President Donald Trump mentioned forgotten people at the inauguration party who will no longer be forgotten. We have to find out who are the forgotten people in each region or each country. And if you look at, I did the analysis of the uh, referendum and the election. <coughs> and then the, the commonality of those two was that they are mostly rural, less educated, older men. And those are the people who are, who are forgotten, and they are the workers. And we have to see who are the forgotten, and we have to include them into the society, and we have to include them as a community, and let them engage into what we are working on, and that's what we have to be doing it. And that's, the, I think, the issue. that I think this long-term issue is also important, but I think it's more of the community, and how do we include the community. In talking about Japan, we don't see that kind of forgotten people. We don't see social divides, even though we have been having a last decade or two decades. And I think we have to see what is the difference in terms of the East and West and find out what's going on in the East and West and see what the conclusion, what kind of best practices we can draw out of it. So if you say that you know, in, in, in the West or in, in the United States that part of the reason for the, the election victory of, of Donald Trump was that there is this group of people older people, mm. maybe more rural people, mm. less educated people who voted overwhelmingly yeah. for, for, mm. voted for Donald Trump, that is it the case that in Southeast Asia there isn't a similar demographic mm. group? Mm. Yeah, in case of Southeast Asia, they are younger in generation. And younger people tend to become more globalized in thinking and they are open-minded. And then we don't see any kind of like a discontent happening in Asia, at least in Japan, in terms of younger people. And uh, therefore, and then there are you know, I mentioned in the, in the room that there are no ultra-right parties in Japan or in Asia. And therefore, I don't think there are that kind of things happening in the, in the East. And we have to see uh, why it is not happening. And I believe that community is a key. And I mentioned that um, in case of Japanese companies or Asian companies, we treat workers as assets. In terms of Western companies, they tend to treat workers as expenses. And whenever they want to cut costs, they cut and fire people. And therefore, there are some people who are forgotten. But in case of Japanese or Asian companies, they tend to treat workers as assets mean. Whenever we see factories relocated, we relocate people as well, workers as well. Whenever we see uh, jobs losing because of modernization or computerization, we retrain, we re-educate, reassign for value added uh, jobs. Whenever we need to fire people, we cut the salary of top management, or we cut the, the uh, top management jobs. And that's what we mean by community. And therefore, we don't see any kind of forgotten people uh, in, the, in, the, in the societies. And they are tend to be included, and they are t treated as families. I think that kind of community-based thinking is a key to think about what is going on in the East and West. What about in the rest? I mean, in, in, in Myanmar, for example, Debbie, um, we've had um, elections, we've had the rise of, of the National League for Democracy. The National League for Democracy victory is not framed as an anti-globalization movement in any way, but in a way it draws on the discontent of a lot of people who felt forgotten and who've been left out of mm -hmm. uh, economic change over the past 20 years. Uh, so could you say something either on Myanmar or, or more generally in this region? Yeah, I think with Myanmar, um it's pretty extreme in that I don't think there's been a country that has opened up so quickly um, in history uh, as Myanmar has, and it's dizzying. Uh, it seems like the world is flocking in, and then people in Myanmar are trying to make up for lost time. So it's a real um, clash. Or uh, I mean, it is very dizzying to have a society that's been isolated for 60 years, and all of a sudden just the lid is off. 
Um, so I think what we're seeing in Myanmar, I mean, Facebook says this is one country in the world where you know, the highest percentage of users. Um, and people in Myanmar equate Facebook with the uh, internet. Um, that's where they get their news, everything. And, and so what that does to a society that was isolated and quite traditional, or um, I think for all of us, um, we're grappling with the dizzying changes. And I think for young people, I mean, they want to embrace globalization and you know, uh, make up for lost time. Uh, but at the same time, there's, um, there's a lot of uncertainty and um, complexity that comes with it and how to make sense of all the changes going on. And, and so I, for us, it's a really uh, fragile time. Um, I think you know, some people want to throw out all the communal val values and, um, and, and some people feel like because it's so uncertain and so com complex, they want to, they're scared and want to hold on to what they know is tr traditional, and um, which means basically afraid of the other. And so then we have the rise of you know, religious conflict um, and uh, ethnic conflict. I think that's more, it was always there for 60 years, but now it, the lid is off. So um, yeah, I think we, we, we need a new sort of mindset and consciousness of how to deal with these really um, all these tensions that have come up to the to the surface now. Yeah, I mean, I guess in a way Myanmar is, a, is an interesting example because on the one hand, it's a country, it's a very poor country, it's a country that can benefit enormously from coming out of isolation, being more connected to the rest of the world, could benefit from, from a more globalized um, environment as well. On the other hand, you know, because Myanmar has such weak institutions, has so many challenges in terms of governance, um, has a relatively uneducated workforce. Right. It's also a country where, I mean, living there, I can see that it's a country where there could easily be a backlash against an opening up, a backlash against um, uh, free trade, foreign companies coming in. Uh, it, could be, it could be channeled in, a, in an ultra-nationalist direction. It could be channeled in uh, a nativist direction uh, right. against also ethnic minorities in the country. Um, and so I guess the question is, you know, is this also something that we could see in other parts of, of right. Asia as well? We've seen a lot of political changes in Asia. We've seen elections in the Philippines, elections in Korea, elections in India recently, as well as in Myanmar, that have really changed uh, politics in, the, right. in those countries. Uh, so it's not as if politics in Asia are, 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 are stable by any means. In Myanmar, at least, I think there is this DNA that goes back 100 years against globalization because of the experiences of colonialism and this sense of exploitation from the outside. So even though we don't see it in Asia today in the same way it's articulated in the West, the question is, is there a latent kind of anti-globalization sentiment? And what would it take for this to, to be more manifest in this region as well? Maybe. <laughs> well, thanks, and, and it's really fascinating to listen to the contextual analysis, and, and at the same time, I think we, re we realize we're dealing with phenomena which are, in a way, you know, very similar when you look at global developments, and they, they might have similar reasons and causes and, and different, if you wish, ways they roll out, but we clearly have a loss of trust and confidence in some kind of established institutions. You, you dubbed this session the fusion of ideas. And ideas could be anything from values, norms, beliefs, but also political and economic systems. And I think there's, a, there's an overriding um, concern about those, those ideas, if you wish, by many pieces of societies. And they're being challenged, they're being questioned, they're being attacked, and they're being attacked from all sides. I mean, when you look at free trade agreements, for instance, you, have a very, you had a very strong kind of leftist a movement against free trade agreement, and then Donald Trump comes in and says, yes, I'm of exactly the same opinion, and he also challenges those agreements. So the, the, the traditional kind of left and right, maybe uh, progressive, restrictive norms don't, don't play out anymore. Mm -hmm. We're having something which is happening in a very different manner. Um, it's threatening because it, it threatens almost everything <coughs> our societies are being built upon. And it, again, it plays out in different phenomena in, in the various contexts. But I think we really need to think hard about how do we deal with this? Because whatever our societies, the business environments, whatever is built upon is being questioned, is being challenged. 
And now, actually, I like the fact that you mentioned how we talk about things. The public narrative mm. becomes a very different one. It becomes very antagonistic. Mm. It becomes almost impossible to find common ground and consensus. And maybe it has to do with the way we talk about things. Mm. Uh, you mentioned assets, right? Mm. Uh, sorry to challenge. I mean, I'm obviously not from a business background. I represent a large NGO. And I get increasingly irritated when people talk about markets mm. rather than societies, people, mm. nation states, whatever. And, you know, the public narrative matters a lot to people. And we are living in a highly interconnected world. And mm. communication, mm. you know, is, is happening around the globe in an incredibly fast way. Mm. And that's what particularly young people, I think, mm. getting very concerned about. Mm. You know, how do we... How do we speak about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in, in that way, I mean, you know, I think what's different, as you mentioned just now with, with the United States, is this sort of um, marriage of anti-free trade sentiment with a more nationalist, almost right-wing nationalist sentiment as, as well. Uh, we don't see that in, in Asia so far. But I wonder if, you know, with social media, with, with changes in the way in which ideas are being diffused, uh, what are the kinds of new ideas on the horizon? Or let me put it in a different way. I think, you know, in Asia, one could say whether uh, different countries had more democratic and open systems or not, most Asian countries, even more democratic Asian countries, had an elite establishment that drove a lot of policy um, and perhaps looked a little bit more uh, to the long term in terms of economic growth and economic change. But with new social media, new, new technologies, do you think that th things are changing in a way that's going to lead to, if not exactly the same kinds of new ideas emerging, very new ideas in terms of coping well, with the future? This year at Davos, there was a breakfast session, private session, called Edelman Trust. And Edelman Trust Barometer has mentioned three collapse in trust, which is very scary. One is leaders are not trusted any longer. CEOs are not trusted. Employees are much more trusted than CEOs. Whatever you say, they are not trusted. Whatever people in the organization say is more trusted because you know, people, leaders tend to take position and they will not take a candidate or they will not speak candidly. But people in the organization will speak you know, to their friends and then they would believe much better than what CEO said. Second collapse in trust is media. Media is no longer be trusted. And you see what happened in Trump's, in Trump's election. All the media supported Trump. And all the media thought that Trump is going to be elected. However, they were wrong. And that's why media has not been trusted. So what happened was that media was not trusted. And therefore, social media was more trusted. CEOs are not trusted. Therefore, people are more trusted. And that social media movement is creating a next, I think, a, trust, a collapse in trust. Third collapse in trust is more scary. It says system is not trusted any longer. The system is not trusted. And therefore, they said, this is wrong, this is wrong. All oh, the system is collapsed. You know, I don't believe in it. And that happens. And then what they say is that globalization, they hate it. Because globalization, they, they say that they would grab jobs, they would deprive jobs. And then in terms of innovation, they don't believe in innovation. Because innovation is going to be the one to be uh, taking our jobs from them. And so what, we, what I said at the World Economic Forum is that the people who participate here is not being trusted any longer. So we have to bridge to them. We have to communicate to them. And we have to create dialogue with them. Otherwise, there's a social device, which we, we may be the one to be creating it. And therefore, I think the social media is going to be the key. Because media is not trusted any longer. But social media is going to be trusted. And then what I said at the Davos is that how many of us are in social media? And how many of us present the ideas, the political ideas, to the people? And how many of us actually do the dialogue with them? And that kind of social media, open platform, is the best way to be reaching out and to be, to be, uh, to be including the, those who, are, who feel that they are forgotten. And that kind of attitude is going to be needed by the leaders. Mm. What do you think, Mr. Chu? I mean, I'd like to pick up two points sure. here. I think what uh, Hori san said is very important. And when Debbie said that, um, Facebook is almost the, has the monopoly of news for the young. That's also very problematic because mm. the accountability of social media is, is now also, you know, uh, thrown into question. How can they make sure there's no fake news or misleading news feeding into the young, which inevitably accept the only medium as, as really what's happening? 
I mean, that's a very important issue. The other important point I want to pick up from what Wolfgang said is that uh, um, Trump is not against trade. Trump is against the multilateral system. Mm. Um, he wants to do it bilaterally because if you do bilateral deals, the US has a, a much stronger uh, bargaining yeah. position, right? The uh, young people are against um, uh, globalization or for, for, for many reasons, right? But what, whatever it is, the WTO that we have is the only non-discriminatory, is the fairest way, is the fairest system that we have. And actually, these bilateral deals or regional deals <coughs> undermines the multilateral system, mm. right? So the, 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 the small players, uh, some of us representing here, have no chance against China or, or the US on bilaterally. So I think this is an issue that we also need to grapple. We have a, a, a fair system, yet it's not working um, as smooth as it should be. We should be focusing and improving and strengthening the system rather than trying to undermine mm. that system which has taken years to build. Yeah. That's the point which I, I, I like to raise as well. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Can I build up on that? Because, yeah. yes, I think you're making a great point, and, and if we expand the horizon a little bit beyond the trade agreements, we have two large global agreements out there, which have been you know, found two years ago amongst the leaders of all nations, which is the Climate Treaty and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, you know, it was, they had an incredible buy-in. Of course, two years into those agreements, they're already under existence, existential threats. And for me, I'm asking, all of us a question, how, what, what can we do to maintain those agreements and, and, and put them more into reality? It's something that international nations have achieved together and now of course is under threat, not just by leaders who are working on more bilateral or individualistic, if you wish, agendas, <clears throat> but of course it's being questioned in the public narrative as well. And, and I think there is, of course, more than, than offering a different narrative. We're dealing with some trends that are making a multipolar world now again more likely, and one of the big trends is inequality, and it plays out almost everywhere you look. I had a lot of interaction with Cambodian youth earlier in the week, you know, when you speak to them, of course, they're highly globalized, you know, they love their country, of course, but they also realize there's a big danger for them to be left behind. And there you have, if we don't take care of these inequalities, you have a huge danger of losing a whole generation for the collective, for the greater common good. Mm. What do you think then are the, the I mean, if we, if we accept that in, in ASEAN at least, mm. there isn't yet a backlash against globalization that we've seen or the kinds of major political disruptions that we've seen in the, in the West. But if we see these challenges coming in the future, whether as a result of inequality, whether as a result of the impact of, of, of social media, uh, challenges in, in governance, just the simple nature of the multilateral system and the, and the different challenges that it throws up. I mean, what are the kinds of things that need to happen in this region to strengthen the region in terms of being able to cope in the future? I know it's a huge question, uh, but you know, are there specific things that, that could take place in this region that would increase its resilience at a time of, of tremendous change, both in terms of technology, climate change, and other challenges as well. Well, ASEAN, the potential of this huge market is still a work in progress because harmonization is not there yet. Um, for example, I, I, I heard from uh, 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 my friend Tony Fernandez last week that uh, he's operating in 10, I mean, Air Asia, right? So, operating in 10 countries in ASEAN, and he's dealing with 10 different regulators and 10, mm. 10 different sets of regulations. Mm. Now, so I think the European model, uh, some of the positive uh, uh, things could be looked at. I mean, in Europe, you're dealing with one regulator and one set of rules. So for cross-border business inside the ASEAN region, it's much easier to, um, to obtain the uh, operational efficiency. Yeah. So I think a lot of efficiency need to be, need to be built. But if part of the answer in this region is greater integration and, and, and reduction of, of barriers between countries and more, I mean, if we look at the European example, that has also thrown up a lot of resistance and, and backlash, right? And if we compare Europe with ASEAN, 
I would suggest that you know, countries in Europe are actually much more familiar with each other than yeah. countries within ASEAN. Yeah. I mean, people in France and Germany follow each other's politics much more intimately than people in different ASEAN countries. People in Myanmar know almost next to nothing about politics in Indonesia or in the Philippines. And I think in a, in a more integrated ASEAN, there is at least the potential for people to resist whether it's the free movement of people or the free movement of, 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 of capital. Um, so, I mean, this is also something, on the, on the one hand, you know, the greater integration of ASEAN could be a big part of the answer, but it could also throw up new problems and challenges for which the region is not really prepared well, psychologically or culturally as well. It's a very good point you make, but the European experiment has a much higher aspiration. It's for eventual you know, political union. My understanding in ASEAN it is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is uh, is trade standards and 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 and, and more cooperation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the tension should be less. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think, yeah. Debbie? Could I ask you? I mean, in in if there are any forgotten people in in Southeast Asia, it's definitely rural people in Myanmar uh, who are amongst the poorest in the region who've really been left out of any kind of positive change for a long time. I mean, what how would you what would you say about their perspectives in terms of their political thinking, in terms of their trust of the current establishment, in terms of how they might view uh, some of the challenges in the future as well? Yeah, I, I think it's still very traditional and, you know, the view of government. The government is far away. They've never helped us. We've always been on our own. Um, but at the same time, they're getting more interconnected. Um, and so there's um, smartphones and, and um, Facebook. And, and so I think there is um, greater aspiration and, and they know they've missed out on a whole era. So farmers say, you know, we know we've missed out and, um, you know, bring it on. We want new technologies. So they're very eager to um, join the rest of the world. So there is that, that very um, energetic and openness um, and whether that can be delivered is a, a different thing. But, but I think there's, um, there's still very much a view of, you know, government is something very far away um, that really has not impacted or, or delivered much in our lives. Mm. Mr. Hoyer, you want to say something? Yeah. What, what ASEAN should do is to keep on learning from the best practices and success and failure of the West and also from the advanced nations. And if you look at the social divides which are happening in the US and Europe, I think they will remain as they are. Mm. And therefore, there are some, something is wrong with the system and societies in those regions. But if you look at Japan, there is no social divide happening. But at the same time, we have been criticized for the past 20 years as being so slow in economy. And the management system was wrong as well. And therefore, we all have to, I think ASEAN has to keep on learning <coughs> about the best practices, the worst practices, and then try to adapt as much as possible. So one thing is, is keep on learning. Second thing, that, you know, to make the society to be resilient, I think the key is the adaptability. You, know, it's like you have to be flexible, meaning like you always have to be able to fuse the ideas from the West or East, and at the same time, you will have to change yourself to be adaptable. The theory of evolution mentioned that the, the animals who have survived was not because of smartness, was not because of strength, but because of adaptability. Whoever can adapt to the changing world become better. So I think ASEAN can learn from the success and failures from EU and from the US and also from Japan, maybe from China as well, and then try to adopt the best ideas as possible and then change, keep changing. And then, uh, and then you know, I think, you know, so the, uh, the, stage, so the stage of um, the modernization is different from each country in ASEAN and also each, each region as well. And therefore we can learn. There are so many things to learn from and then you can leave frog as well. Mr. Jaman, if I could ask you, if you want to respond to any of that, but also to ask you, I mean, then what do you think in terms of what are the best practices in this part of the world? Actually, uh, what are the positive elements here that perhaps are, are, are lessons for others as well? Excellent. And, and actually, I wanted to come back to that because it was the underlying question to this session. I mean, what can we learn from what works in this region? And obviously, I'm the only non-Asian on this panel, so I'm not the best place to answer that question. I'd rather... I'd rather pose the question. 20, 25 years ago, I wrote my thesis on um, overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia and how their cultural identities, their norms, the way they did kind of interact with each other made their businesses tick. And it was actually quite fascinating to speak to some of these 
business leaders and saying, you know, we're family oriented, we're very relational, we know to trust each other, we have these concepts of Yu Yi and Guangxi and, you know, things that, but they said the young generation, our own generation will spoil all of that. Now, that was 25 years ago, but when I listen to what I'm being told now, these are very stable concepts and they have played into today's um, way maybe business is being exercised despite globalization. We talked about long-term thinking prior to this, um, to this panel. We talked about, again, how much relational issues do play a role and how much stability mm. they provide. We also learn about some concepts that are really almost alien to Western concepts. I was reminded of sufficiency economy as a philosophical concept mm. of Thailand, of the king of mm -hmm. Thailand, and you know whether there's criticism or not, of course. But these are very, very different and very strong philosophical almost underlying principles to the economy. Mm. So I would, would be interested to hear how important, how stabilizing they are, and maybe how much the rest of the world can also learn from this. Yeah. I guess this is a, Debbie, you wanted to say something? No, I was gonna say, I mean, I wonder to what extent this, this kind of uh, idea around uh, equality and the need to promote equality and not to have people left behind. I mean, one is the Japanese case, but Japan is a very homogeneous society as well. Uh, in some other ASEAN countries, in Myanmar, Indonesia, a much less homogeneous society, their ethnic divides, uh, that kind of inequality could also take on an ethnic complexion as, as, as well. I mean, you know, sort of building on what Mr. Jaman said, do you think that ASEAN will be good at um, lessening inequality, or do you think that in many ASEAN countries, the structures and the ideas are not in place to really meet that challenge? I, I, I have hope. I think the... Um ASEAN, as uh, Horizon said, had the luxury of looking at what has worked, what has not worked in other parts of the world. And, um, and we have a, a very enlightened <coughs> and uh, smart uh, 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 leaders here. And um, I think they have what it takes to make ASEAN a better place. Mm. I think what, what you said is also very interesting. I mean, the Guanxi is a plus and a minus. It is, um, <clears throat> it brings um, it's efficient and you don't need to second guess your, your partner because there's a, there's a trust factor here which is built on DNA, language and, and history. On the other hand is, you know, we have the challenge of cronyism versus professionalism, right? right? And you, you have the, uh, also the challenge of uh, transparency versus opaque behind the scene uh, deals, right? So I think we need to hopefully the young generation can pick up the good part of it and grow into uh, the positive, the, the globalized, accepted international norms and standards in terms of cross-border uh, global business. So yeah. perhaps in some ways, I mean, this is a very testing time for ASEAN because the challenges are there. We have this young, growing middle class. We have still a certain trust in the establishment and in the elites that haven't worn away in the mm -hmm. same way as they have in some some Western countries, but really what happens in the next five or 10 years is going to be key. If these same elites at the same political establishment are not able to adapt and meet some of these new challenges, perhaps in five or 10 years in many ASEAN countries, we will see this sort of backlash against uh, existing elites that we've seen uh, in other parts of the world. Do you think that's, that's yeah, fair? I think it's important for ASEAN and Asian not to create uh, forgotten people, like uh, uh, people who feel, who feel they're left behind. And those people who feel that they have been left behind or forgotten is not because of inequality. It, I think it's because of the sense of belonging from the community. So it's like a caring for people. And then the society itself is caring for people and try to include them. <coughs> and inclusiveness is going to be important. And that, because inequality will happen, inequality of uh, income will happen because of the mm -hmm. you know, capitalistic system. And however, whatever happens in terms of disparity of income, I think we should be always be there to be include them into the community and treat them as a uh, assets, treat them as a family, and that kind of uh, the value is going to be the key to sustain uh, the development of ASEAN and Asia. Yeah, I wanted to throw out a couple of other ideas before we, we open it up. One is that. You know, it seems to me that you know, we are living in, in a period of such fast technological change and where the nature of growth and, and jobs is going to change around the world. And you know, we hear in other, other panels and, and sessions here about the coming 
digital economy and what that's going to mean and the need for, for people to think completely differently about jobs in the rest of the 21st century. And I think part of the reaction that has led to political change in America and, and, and in other parts of the West is that some people don't want this change. It's not just that they're anxious about not getting the job in the future, they may just not want that new type of job in the future. They may, be, they may look back maybe in a nostalgic way on their own life 10 years ago or their parents' lives 20, 30 years ago. And my question is, in this part of the world, in ASEAN, is it different? Are people more ready for change? Uh, is it a demographic thing because it's younger people? Or is there something else that makes people want to adapt? Or is it not the case? I mean, is it, is it the case, the opposite, that people here also will start to look very nostalgically to the past and, and resist the pace of change that we're seeing uh, in this region, or, or inevitably we'll see in this region as well? Maybe. I think in this region, uh, in Asia, um, the, the, what you mentioned, education is the key. Education is the key for uh, being able to change. Education, especially lifelong education, is going to be the key to be able to sustain because you know there are lots of jobs are changing and the system is changing, technology is changing, AI is coming, robotics are changing, and therefore uh, in the lifetime, the, nobody will be able to retain the same job for let's say 30 or 40, 40 years. And they have to keep on changing. And some people who resist changes will be left behind. Hmm. And we just have to include them to get re-educated and then to keep up to the technology and keep up to the social media and then let, let them include. And then we have to be very uh, 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 consistent. And at the same time, you know, always we have to be uh, long term, take a long term view to make them include. And that attitude, I think, is a key mm -hmm. to maintain the society. Can, can I add a dimension? Sure. I mean, you're of course very right. And if I would single out one other aspect besides inequality, it is the rapid technological change mm -hmm. that contributes to the, to the mess around us. Mm -hmm. Now, can we be optimistic because half of the population in the region is, is below 30? Of course not, mm -hmm. because today a 35-year-old is already overwhelmed by mm -hmm. what's happening in terms of te technological change. Mm -hmm. So as excited as we can be, mm -hmm with all the opportunities that come with it, just, just <coughs> recognize that it's going so fast. If you talk to a 25-year-old, you know, he or she will already be overtaken by a 15-year-old you know, who's cooking up something in the garage. On, so, so, I mean, the, the, the rapid change is not just overwhelming, let's say, an older generation. Mm. It's overwhelming whole societies. Yeah. And That's if right. we are not intentional and cautious mm. and only see opportunities, mm. You know, the inclusivity of data, the protection of, you know, the dangers that come with IT technology. I think these are areas that require a lot of thinking and intentionality about it. Uh, this is not just about opportunities. We have about 20 minutes left, and I wanted to open it up to the floor to see if there are any questions before we continue. Uh, please, yes. I'll just yell. Uh, question to you, Mr. Yeah, you need to use the microphone. There's a mic right there. I'd love to follow up on your, as the only uh, non-Asian on the panel, I'd love to follow up on your point about the global the existential threats towards the SDG as this move towards populism. Some people are saying this is the beginning of a possibly 20-year shift towards those politics in the West. I'm wondering what your prediction is about the SDGs if, in fact, this 20-year shift is just beginning and can Asian political leaders step up and fill that void? And if so, who do you think will play that role? Thank you. Thanks. I mean, very quickly, you know, in our business, we're supposed to be optimists by nature, so we do believe that global frameworks like we have at the moment carry a lot of strength and possibility opportunities. What we, what we need to have to make, them, to make them real is accountability mechanisms for those whom those SDGs are supposed to be beneficial for, you know? So whatever data we're collecting on SDG progress, it can't come just through central statistical bureaus. It needs to come bottom up from communities who are holding everyone accountable for what those sustainable development goals are supposed to deliver. So my organization invests in community scorecards, you know, asks people, what does reach you in terms of all these benefits that are being promised to you? I think that's when you get much more cohesion around those goals, uh, rather than having this one a top-down approach. I don't know whether that answers your question, but uh, this is at the moment a, a critical mm -hmm. element 
I think that we need to st invest in uh, to make SDGs successful. Are there other questions? No. All right, let me just throw out one other idea and then we can, we can sort of go back around to our core question of, of what does this region have to, to, to offer the rest of the world, which is that, you know, sitting here in, in, in Phnom Penh or if we sit in Bangkok or Singapore or even in Yangon now, I mean, in a way, these are places that are not only opening up and are relatively open or very open in the case of Singapore for a long time, uh, but these are, you know, in their core DNA, these are very cosmopolitan places, mm. Bangkok, Yangon, Jakarta, mm. Mm. Singapore. I mean, they grew up as, as trade cities and as emporia. And so is it the case that, you know, Southeast Asian politics, Southeast Asian elites are almost by nature or by history relatively quite cosmopolitan um, and, and are less inward looking to some extent than elites perhaps have been in other parts of the world. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, is there, is there something in the emerging kind of, uh, not just the ASEAN way, but the DNA of this region uh, that, is, that is much more uh, outward looking and, and wanting and, and, and used to working with very different people? Uh, if you take my, our country in, in, in Myanmar, for instance, in Yangon, since its founding 200 years ago, and, and certainly since 100, 150 years ago under colonial times, I mean, we had people from all over the world living in Yangon. So the elites in, in Myanmar are very used to working with people from China, from India, from the West and elsewhere. And perhaps that's a little bit different than some other parts of the world. And, and, and perhaps there is, that, there is that resilience in the face of some of the, the, the challenges of globalization that there might be elsewhere. What do you think, I, I think you're so right. But, but the, the whole, I mean, the whole issue is Bangkok versus the rest of Thailand, mm. right? Mm. And Tokyo versus the rest of Japan. Mm. I think that's really the challenge. The people who feel they're forgotten are not the urban mm. elites. Mm. Mm. They are the people in the suburban mm. and, uh, and mm. the rural areas mm. who feel that they have been disenfranchised, mm. whether it's politically, economically, on a national, regional, and global basis. Mm. And that's where we need to be sensitive. Mm. And that's why I think what you say about community Strengthening is so important. But, but then the question is, you know, if, if you have rural populations that feel left out in Thailand or in elsewhere, uh, it may not come out as an anti-globalization movement because free trade still works relatively well for many Asian countries. It may come out in very different ways. It's I mean, the red shirt movement is, it's I mean, anti it's anti -elites. I mean the I mean the unhappiness is really is a, is the perception that the elites have shortchanged the rest of the uh, electorate or, or population, mm. and we have to show that uh, that's not the case. The 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 uh, the, um, the people who are in favour of uh, globalisation is not taking a selfish or elitist view. Mm. Uh, globalisation doesn't mean globalisation of culture. It means globalisation of trade, and maybe try to benchmark to the best standards for the benefit of of everybody. Mm. So the legitimacy of the globalization uh, leaders is to show that we bring the whole community up. I think that's really our, 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 the, the challenge we should be focusing on. Yeah, so yeah. in that way, I mean, what are the, the positive things that countries in ASEAN have done so far over the past few years uh, that have meant that they have been able to cope uh, with these challenges perhaps a little bit better than the rest of the world? Do you have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe that could Go ahead. My <laughs> Well, I think there's a, you know, an emphasis on community and taking care of each other. That's been good. But then the flip side has been that it's been very family oriented and I think tends to be quite, can be insular. Um, that anybody who's different from me or outside of my family, you know, um, isn't part of the system, my system. Um, and, and the nepotism that happens and the cronyism is, is it's very much, a, a mindset that you know it's okay to be greedy and financially sus to be financially successful, um, and you know that's just not a uh, that's just a mindset that won't work anymore. It's just uh, pragmatically, uh, you know, uh, you can't do that. Um, and um, so I think the mindsets really need to change, and it's about mm. having a consciousness that it's about the whole ecosystem, not only our um, my family, but outside my family, the nation and the community, but even the um, you know the animals and the and the, the whole environment that uh, supports us. 
So it's a much larger sense of consciousness in the biosphere. And that's just um, in the Asian context. And I think, you know, globally we need that too, that we are, for the first time in human history, you know, becoming one family, sharing one biosphere. And uh, it's not, it's not, you know, because of the um, interconnected, the internet age and connecting all of us, that um, there's that sense of we are all in this, in this together. And so how does that translate as, you know, for leaders and elites to change their mindsets of, of um, and have a different way of operating? Um, so I think, I think we have to grow in a different sense of empathy um, and have a civilization of empathy um, that is maybe different and, and much deeper. I think when you're starting a, from a very low point, then the legitimacy is the amount of people you can bring over the poverty line. <clears throat> but I think in the future, that's not enough yeah. because of the, you know, as you say, the, the expectation has risen and the social media and technology has played a point. Just above the poverty line is not enough to satisfy the, the young and, and the masses. So that's, that's hugely uh, challenging. Mm. But yeah. then if we think that, you know, Part of the reason for relative stability in this part of the world is that in the last 20, 30 years, lots, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. Growth and, and, and free trade have worked for many people, mm -hmm. that there are people who've been relatively left behind, but maybe not to a point where this has resulted in major uh, mm -hmm. social tensions, except mm -hmm. with perhaps a few uh, exceptions. But going forward with social media, there are rising expectations. The nature of politics is also going to change. And if we accept that in the West, one big problem is that there's a feeling that elites are very distant from ordinary mm. people, right? That they've lost touch, that the politics in Washington are different from what ordinary people are thinking and talking about, that even politics in London or in Brussels is different from uh, what people are, are thinking and talking about elsewhere. Can we be hopeful that elites in um, Southeast Asia will be that much more in touch with ordinary people and, and constituencies or, or not? I mean, is there anything to be hopeful about in, in the practicality, in the, in the flexibility of adaptability of elites and their willingness also to, uh, to stay in touch with ordinary uh, citizens? I think you know, ASEAN has to be always open-minded. Right? So there will be no way for ASEAN countries to become anti-globalized. And then I had a discussion with Kishore Mahubani before, two days ago, about this, this topic. And then he said clearly that you know, ASEAN countries have to keep on opening up. Therefore, you mentioned that all the leaders in these regions have to be able to speak English and have to be able to communicate and have to be able to think about globalize and then have to think about what is going on in the world and have to keep on learning from what's going on. At the same time, all those, like you mentioned, there's a divide in terms of cities and rural area. And therefore, the elites have to be able to bridge gaps with them. And we have to reach out to them. And they have to keep on discussing. And what happened was that they are being you know, drifted away from the populist you know, sentiments. And therefore, they tend to make mistakes in terms of voting. And why it happens is that because there has not been enough interaction. There has not been enough dialogue. And therefore, I think we all, if you believe that we are the leaders, we always have to think about what's going on globally. At the same time, we have to think of what is going on locally. And we always have to be communicating to the world. At the same time, we have to be communicating to the local people. And they keep on doing public education and public uh, diplomacy and public talking to them, uh, communication with them by using social media is a key to it. Therefore, I think the leaders have to be able to communicate both in English and the same to local languages. And then to be able to communicate to them and try to ma make them aware that globalization is the way to go. We have to open up. At the same time, there should be, you know, there should be some kind of technological advancement. So we have to be re-educating ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that kind of a constant communication is going to be needed. Constant mm -hmm. dialogue is going to be key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe before we close up, just to kind of wrap up a little bit in terms of what we talked about. I mean, one is the starting point of the disruptions in the West and the changes there. Uh, I think we've all agreed to mm -hmm. some extent that uh, it's not the same here. Uh, but that there are challenges going forward, that part of the reason that there aren't uh, the same kind, the same similar sort of anti-establishment political landscape, at least in parts of Southeast Asia, is that 
globalization has worked differently and that more people have benefited, or at least there's, there's a perception of that, uh, that there are a lot of people who may feel disenfranchised in other ways and feel forgotten, left out. But that politics hasn't come out necessarily in the same kind of anti-establishment feeling or anti-globalization feeling as we've seen in the Anglo-Saxon countries or in, or in parts of Europe but that there's still an enormous hill to climb, or many hills to climb, that there are big challenges around the corner, uh, that we have these forgotten populations, that there are major governance challenges, issues of cronyism and corruption, things that local people may not be willing to uh, accept five years or 10 years from now in the way that they might have been even five or 10 years ago. Um, but with that, if I could ask you for some from final thoughts on, on really the, the central question that we're facing, I mean, what what are the pros and cons of this region? And especially, what are the, the areas of um, uh, strength uh, that perhaps uh, could even be exported elsewhere? I mean, are there ASEAN ways of coping with these things, of change, of technological change, of inequalities, uh, that are lessons for the rest of the world? I just have one, because we had so few questions, and there's one question there. I just wanted to take one question. Yeah. Mic. Oh, sorry. get closer to the people that they want to reach. Um, but when you combine this with the mentioned, aforementioned collapse in trust in systems, leaders, and media, as well the people uh, who feel forgotten, and the sentiment that social media brings out rebellious uh, sentiments against um, the status quo <coughs> in people, um, coupled with the fact that the election of Trump in the US has largely been credited to social media campaigns. Do you think that actually the pros of social media um, is that great in outweighing its cons in possible social upheavals? Um, because especially in a lot of Asian countries now, for example in China, you see social media being very tightly controlled um, precisely for that reason. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, are, are we really, I mean, we've been singing social media a lot of praises, but does it deserve the praises that we are saying? And uh, is there a, a way to, you know, correctly control it to make it more um, sort of conducive rather than disruptive to society? All right, thank you. And just maybe one very final question. Then we'll yes, thank you for yes, thank you very much. Uh, Ibu Sieber, Swiss ambassador to Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. Uh, there was an interesting discussion about um, values and ideas. I was wondering if you could give some ideas, uh, some, some of your views on, on, on governance ideas. We see a trend in the region to more authoritarian uh, rule. <laughs> Quite a few countries in ASEAN have the trend. How do you respond and reconcile that with the idea that you have more participation through social media? How do you, how do you rationalize that, those trends? Thank you. So lots of very big questions about the, the impact and the future of social media and is it, is, it, is it a good thing to think about how that could be shaped or governed uh, in a way that doesn't have excessive negative uh, impact on, on politics. And this, uh, the question from the ambassador about uh, the sense of increasing authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism uh, in different parts of the world, but including in this part of the world, and, and, and how do people see the, the future of that? I guess how to link this all back to, to what we were talking about before is that, you know, in this region, like in the rest of the world, it's not the case that all good things are going to come together, that new technology, new social media, increased globalization, moves towards democratic governance. We know that that narrative is broken to some extent, or at least it's not going to be a linear and easy process. And in Southeast Asia, it's too soon to really know what shape um, some of these big trends will, will take. So I guess maybe to wrap up, if, I mean, any comments you have on or, or answers to these questions, but any sort of final thoughts on, you know, what are the biggest fears you would have for this region, uh, given the changing political landscape around the world, but also what are the, what are the sources of, of resilience or possible strength uh, going forward in the future? Uh, as well. Maybe sure. if I could start with So that. in terms of the two questions, I, I'd like to link them. I mean, social media cannot replace good governance. So whoever thinks about you know, using social media in, term, in a manipulative term 
and now he'll, he or she will be waking up soon, sooner than later. I think there's, there's, there's something to social media that is uncontrollable. And if you think you, know, you can restrict, you can, you, you can manipulate, this might be helping in the short term, but in the long term, no. And it's, it's something that is unleashed, if you wish. So good governance is, is required, you know, whatever you do in terms of communication. Um, and I think <laughs> this particular region here, and you know, allow me not to speak in stereotypes, but when we work with the communities in the countries in ASEAN, and I compare them a bit with communities where we work with elsewhere in the world, you have something which is very particular here, which is a high susceptibility to, to values, actually, to, to positive values, if you wish. Uh, met a lot, a lot of mm. young, young people again in, in Cambodia recently and, and how, they, how they react to the opportunities to speak about things that they think they are right, you know, it's quite amazing. I think there's an incredible potential for young people but also maybe rural communities, you know, to build upon those susceptibility to values. And at the same time, you can really spoil this because the people do not speak about their political leaders in a very positive term. I mm. mean, there's a lot of skepticism. And if bad governance continues, you know, in many instances, you know, corruption, whatever, um, you, have, you have a high risk. When you look at the dangers, and that's your question, um, don't look at Europe or America. Look at places like the Middle East that have been stable like five, six, seven years ago and now completely disintegrate. And why? Because young people went to the streets you know, they called it an Arab revolution with all the backlash, and, and now you have a whole whole region disintegrating, mm. and you don't want to you don't want to experience something like mm. that. Mm. Debbie, yeah, I think um, it's really going to be up to the elites and leaders um, to have a higher level of consciousness, and um, and and so my you know that's my fear is that they won't uh, get it fast enough to uh, be much more inclusive and pluralistic in building institutions and governing. Um, so um, I think whatever we can do to, in our own sphere of influence, to, um, to help leaders really understand the, um, the urgency of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Horry? Yeah. I believe in social media because social media has given us the voices to be speaking up and reaching out to other people. Without social media, we have to beg mass media to give us the voices. And therefore, they had the power. Now, we have the power. And it's up to us how we use social media. In terms of ASEAN, I believe in the future of ASEAN you know, strongly because they have a strong uh, eagerness to learn. But so therefore, you know, it has to be, a Asian people have been learning from the West. And it has to be two-way streamed. And therefore, I think it's about time that West learn from the East in terms of the attitude and also community approaches. And that I'm more worried about what's going on in terms of US and the, mm. the, the Europe. And therefore, I think we should discuss this in Europe and also in the US to talk about what's going on in social divides. And that's more important. Mm. That's more scary for me. Mr. Chu? Yes. In terms of social media, I think it's like globalization. The train has left the station. Actually, the plane have, have left the airport, right? Uh, you can't reverse it. We need to strengthen, protect, and provide better governance of that. And I think, as many all of us agree, social media does have its tremendous uh, contribution to society if it's used you know, wisely and properly. In terms of particip participating politics here, I think depending on where, you know, where your point of... Uh, social and economic development. Mm. If you're emerging from a wanton country mm. or after revolution, the masses will be satisfied um, if they have a, have a roof to protect them and, and he, enough basic necessities. But once you get into a situation of a middle class, that's not enough. The expectations are high and the, the leaders have to be a lot more uh, alert. Anything can happen. Mm. We are in a period of rapid change. So my, 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 my take, actually, in this uh, discussion is not only do we have to do what our fathers do, you know, I always look up to my father's values and hard work, family-oriented. We need to listen to our children and grandchildren mm -hmm. because uh, I think we need to have both. And that's where ASEAN and, and this part of the world generally have that advantage. Yeah. 
No, thank you very much. I think maybe in closing, just to say that I think that, um, I mean, we've all highlighted the different challenges. I think we all accept that, you know, Southeast Asia and ASEAN won't be immune from the big challenges that will come from, from technological change, but from other changes as well. Uh, that a key is adaptability, um, not uh, leaving big parts of the electorate or, or, or population uh, behind. And in that way, maybe a key strength of ASEAN is these are all countries that have changed so much in the last 50, 60 years that adaptability is not something very new. Mm -hmm. That in a way, there isn't an arrogance of thinking that there is only a particular way of doing things. And I don't think in any ASEAN country there was ever a sense that free markets, democracy, globalization was the answer to everything. And I think there's a, there's a practicality or in, in, in many ASEAN elites whether or not they will then be able to meet the challenges ahead, bring their populations along, educate them properly, um, I think it's a big question mark. And I think probably the future is going to be one where different ASEAN countries are able, or different ASEAN elites and establishments are able to rise to the challenge in very different ways. And some countries may not meet the challenge and, and, and others will, but a lot more to, to discuss in the future. But with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.